make the Family Easter Fest such an incredible experience. I want to say a huge welcome to all of you who are with us for the first time celebrate Resurrection Day. And uh, it is, it's a great day, a great day to be together. And I hope that you will experience the love of Jesus Christ in a very real way this morning. Uh, there are so many great things about Neighborhood Church. One of the things about us is that we are people from all over the world, and so many people speak different languages, and we had a request made back in January uh, that written, written notes would help people follow along, and so I started doing that, realized we can use Google Translate to translate those notes to make them easier for you to follow. So if you happen to be here with us, and another language is your language, we got 14 different languages spoken by people who attend our church that are available online, BNC. Dot org forward slash notes, including English. If you, English is your favorite, you can get that as well. And you don't have to follow those along. I will not speak exactly what they say, but you can take them to help follow along or remember what you heard when you uh, go home later today. And I hope that you will find it to be a very, uh, a very special and helpful message as we kick off this series on healthy relationships, but doing it on Easter Sunday. And, and there's a reason for that, because the most important relationship of all was brought into being on Easter Sunday. The most important relationship of all was brought into being and celebrated on Easter Sunday. And we want to read the story, the account of Easter, as is recorded by the Apostle John in the Gospel of John chapter 20. I'll have the words on the screen behind me. We're going to read a good chunk of that chapter today. And if you're not familiar with the Bible, the Bible has two different parts. The Old Testament focuses on God's dealing mostly with the people of Israel, but also the rest of the world uh, up until about the time of about 400 BC uh, and, and 400, 450 BC. But then the New Testament starts with the coming of Jesus. And it it opens with four different stories that tell us the life of Jesus, written by four different people who were there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And John was one of the closest disciples and followers of Jesus. And if you've been attending neighborhood, you know we went through the whole gospel of John last year. And you may say, Alan, why are we going back to John? Well, that's because we looked at Easter at Christmas last year. So we're going to look at the Easter story again but there's something significant as we kick off this series in relationships that you're going to see that we didn't bring out when we looked at this on Christmas Day of last year. So, again, if you're not familiar with the story, Easter is about Jesus rising again from the dead three days after he died on the cross. Cross was the worst form of punishment the Romans had devised. It was torture for the worst of criminals as a public execution so all people would see those who had been killed that way and say, I don't want to die like that person. I definitely don't want to do the crime that person did. But the difference was Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. The Bible says he was without sin, the only person ever to live who was fully innocent. And yet he died as a falsely accused criminal in order to pay for the sins of all of mankind. And we'll see what that means today. And yet after he died on the cross, he was taken down, placed in a rich man's tomb. And then three days later, that early Easter Sunday morning, we find ourselves here in John chapter 20, verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. That's John's word for himself, trying to be incognito. And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So remember, this was a tomb that Jesus had been laid in. Mary and some other women had seen him get buried there. She knew he should have been there, but the tomb was rolled away. The tomb was empty. The stone had been rolled away. She was disturbed. She ran back, told the other disciples. And so down in verse 3, so Peter and the other disciple, that is John, started toward the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. And Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. 
They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now notice, Mary saw an empty tomb. Peter and John saw an empty tomb, but they have not yet seen Jesus. Verse 11, Mary decided to go back. So Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, the same day, that evening, when the disciples were together, With the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, so the disciples were overjoyed when they had seen the Lord. Jesus showed them where the nails had been and where the sword had been run into his side that the soldiers had done there on the cross. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And down in verse 23. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for the truth of the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. And what that means for us. And these words, peace be with you. What they mean for us. And I pray, Father, that we all would come understand their significance today. And for any here today, Lord, who do not know your peace, I pray that today would be the day they understand the victory of Easter and how incredible this peace is as they invite you into their lives. We love you and praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Peace be with you. Think about it. These are the first words Jesus said to his disciples when they were all gathered together after rising from the dead. Peace be with you. John says three times, twice in the first meeting, once again in the next week. Luke also records Jesus saying these exact same words in his first appearance to the disciples in the Gospel of Luke. Peace be with you. In Greek, two words, irene humin, means peace be with you. There must be something significant about that, especially when we realize the Gospels never, none of them, none of the four record Jesus saying these words to his disciples before the resurrection. There had to be something that the resurrection brought in that enabled Jesus to say these words for the first time to the disciples, and I bet they are loaded with meaning. And if we understand The meaning of these two simple Greek words, especially the first one, and the first one in English, we'll get it. Now, our problem is, in English, peace is, it's a good word. I mean, peace is always a good thing. Like, I remember elementary school, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Anybody else old like me remember those? Okay, I mean, peace is wonderful. I mean, it is, good. And right now we're paying for for peace in Israel and Gaza and Ukraine. We, peace to come. 
And I remember as a kid growing up again, showing my age when we had this little symbol, peace man. Remember that? Okay, and you know where it came from, actually, was Winston Churchill, British Prime Minister during World War II. And he used it to mean victory, because that's the letter V, which would mean peace. Because once they finally ended the war, Germany surrendered, England was at peace, America was at peace, and then after uh, Japan surrendered, the world was at peace. And so it was that that drummer of the world's most famous band of the 1960s, Ringo Starr, started going peace man, and it got picked up by everybody, especially the anti-nuclear, anti-Vietnam War peace movement, and it became eventually, by the 70s, a general greeting for certain people, most of the guys had longer hair. You know, it was just what you did. And, and it became a, a peace, and in a sense... The English idea is sort of like the Greek idea. It means an end to conflict. And so we can say, war's end, it's a good thing. Yes, 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 peace is good. And the Greek idea has that same sort of concept, an end to conflict. I mean, even personally, if you've ever had a disagreement, I mean, some families, you don't want to get together with your family for Easter dinner because there ain't no peace in the house when you have dinner with that certain brother-in-law or whoever the case may be. You know, there's a sense that we know that even on a personal level, peace is good. But the problem is neither the Greek word nor the English word can come anywhere near encompassing what the Hebrew word is. And I've got a slide for it here. I think the first one is the Irene. That's, the, that's the, the Hebrew one, Shalom. And even to this day, if you go and you visit and you go on vacation to Israel, you know, in America we say, when you meet somebody, hello. And what does hello mean? Nothing. I mean, it's like, I see you. I mean, it's just nice and polite. But when you go to Israel and they say shalom, guess what? That greeting is loaded with powerful blessing. We often translate it poli- uh, poli- peace, excuse me. You know, there is this sense of peace, but the English word cannot encompass all of it. Because here's, here's what the word involves. In its purest definition, it is an overall state of well-being, body, mind, heart, soul, spirit, but not just on the inside. It is in your area of relationships, all of the relationships, not just in you, but within you to others, everything about all of that, but it finds its source in the most important relationship of all. That is, it flows out of this encounter of a living relationship with the living God. With him as our foundation, it becomes a fountain that overflows, first of all, in us, but through us to others. Isn't that awesome? That's shalom. How many of you like to have shalom in your life? I mean, and and in fact, that's why we're starting this series on relationships dealing with shalom, because shalom is indeed, you know, biblical peace. And that would have been the language that Jesus and his disciples spoke, Aramaic, very closely related to Hebrew. They didn't speak Greek. They translated the New Testament into Greek because that was the language that the culture communicated. A lot of you were not born in America, and when you go home today, you're not going to be speaking English. You know English because you go to school here, you got a job here, and in America, you have to do that. But your heart language, when you're with your family, is something else. And that was the case for Jesus and his disciples. So he probably didn't say, Irene Humin. He probably said, Shalom Lecha. Peace to you. And then with that, this idea of the overflowing of Shalom. But you know, we want shalom. Even people who don't know God, who don't believe in Jesus, recognize the value of real peace. The world's longest running longitudinal study, an academic study where they track people over long periods of time, has been going on for over 90 years. Started in Harvard University in the 1930s, it's called the Harvard Study of Adult Development. And they chose hundreds of people in the 1930s that they would track throughout their lives through a series of interviews to see how they progressed, to see what happened with them. It's now gone on into three generations. Those people, their children, now their grandchildren, over 1,400 people have been studied. And the current two directors, Robert Waldinger and Mark Schultz, published the findings over 90 years of watching people to see how they live and especially to see what makes people happy and not just a temporary happiness, but an overall state of well-being. Remember, these guys are not Christians. Harvard Harvard University, no longer Christian. They're not trying to prove anything related to the gospel here. But guess what they found? 
Quote, through all the years of studying these lives, one crucial factor stands out for consistency and power in its ties to physical health, mental health, and longevity. That's how long you live. Contrary to what many people may think, it's not career achievement or exercise or a healthy diet. One thing continually demonstrates its broad and enduring importance, good relationships. He said, if we could boil everything down in our study and all the hundreds of others with similar and related studies, it would be this, quote, good relationships keep us healthier and happier, period. Good relationships. And if you've had good relationships, you know how precious they are, how valuable they are. There's nothing like it. And Kira and I have been married now 35 years. It's, it's awesome. It's incredible. I love, I'm glad God invented this marriage thing. It gets better all the time. You know, it's great stuff there. But you know, marriage relationships don't always work out though, do they? I mean, think about it. Think about all the famous stories you've read. Think about the world's most famous play. Romeo and Juliet. There was a young couple in love. How'd that end for them? Yeah, they both died and so did most of their relatives. I mean, come on, that's not a very good situation there. And, uh, you know, look at the statistics. About half of all marriages end in divorce. That's first marriages. You would think people who had it, got it messed up the first time, they'd figure it out and get it better the next time. Yeah, that's not how it works. Second marriages have a higher rate. Third marriages, 73% of them, almost three in four of third marriages end in divorce. I guess trial and error doesn't work in the marriage department. Well, maybe what about a trial run first? I mean, before you buy a car, why not take it out for a test drive and see how it works beforehand? So what about living together before getting married? Did that help increase the likelihood of staying married? Nope. People who cohabit before getting married are 31% more likely to get divorced than those who, who wait to live together until they've been married. Oh my goodness, none of this is good. Well, maybe marriage is the problem. What if we just live together and don't ever get married? Sorry, those people are less happy and they live less longer than married people. Wow, I mean, what are you gonna do, be alone? Loneliness is worse than all of it. Relationships are just messy, aren't they? Just messy. Here's some interesting quotes. Susan Sontag. It's hard, it hurts to love. It's like giving yourself to be flayed, which means cut open, and knowing that at any moment the other person may just walk off with your skin. No, thank you. Amanda Grace. What do you do when the one person you want comfort from the most is the one who caused your pain? How can I want so desperately for him to wrap me up in his arms, but want, also want so much for him to leave me alone? Cassandra Clare in Clockwork Prince. Must I go bound while you go free? Must I love a man who doesn't love me? Must I be born with so little art as to love a man who will break my heart? Relationships are hard. They're messy, and yet we crave them. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've had relational troubles, because we all have. But whatever relational troubles you have, I can't imagine they're nearly as bad as those of Karen Reed. I don't know if you're from Boston, but her, she's all over the news in Boston right now. Because she's been accused and ready to stand trial for the murder of her former boyfriend, Boston police officer John O'Keefe, who had been found dying outside a home in Canton, Massachusetts. He'd been left mortally wounded in the rapidly accumulating snow. Police have charged that she was enraged at him because of pain in their disintegrating relationship. So she dropped him off in the car and then backed into him in the midst of a snowstorm and then drove off to let him die. They found pieces of the plastic of her car there underneath the snow after he was found dead there. And this is only one of dozens of stories around the country of a jilted lover, an angry ex, someone who just could not deal with the pain of the emotion of a failed relationship and took it out in a very violent way. That's even last week's number one hit single on the Billboard Hot 100, 
Ariana Grande's title says it all. We can't be friends. But why? Why can't we get along? Why can't we get relationships to work? Well, the Bible actually tells us that. It actually gives us the answer, the reason why relationships are so hard. It also gives the answer to the solution to our relationship problem. And how Easter, Easter itself, the resurrection of Jesus, is the gateway to the ultimate solution. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, another passage we're going to look at a lot. We've got the, the words on the screen behind me here. But this passage is so significant because it tells the story. And it starts in these first few verses to explain to us why we tend to not do well in relationships or in other areas of life. I mean, you think about it. Think about the intellectual firepower that's in this room right now. How many technical engineers do we have who are working on artificial intelligence, designing all kinds of things? The city of Bellevue itself, the east side of Seattle, all the stuff that we have figured out how to do, all the technology, even watching the buildings rise, all the engineering, all this stuff, and we still can't get our relationships straightened out. Why? Let's read these first few verses. Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you and me, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Dead? What do you mean dead? I haven't been dead yet. You mean spiritually dead. It's kind of like that old TV show, Walking Dead. That's us. Were, past tense. If you believe in Jesus, it's no longer the case. You've not yet come to know this risen Savior we're talking about today. It's not yet the case for you. Notice he said, you were dead in your transgressions. That means you broke the law, broke God's eternal law. You did something wrong. And your sins, another word for the wrongdoing we do. You know, you think about it in humanity. It's pretty obvious. Anybody ever met somebody who was perfect? Anybody ever met somebody who never, ever made a mistake? No, I don't see any hands up here, right? We've all made mistakes. And the problem is in our culture, well, everybody makes mistakes. It's no big deal. Well, here, this verse just told you, yes, it is. It is a very big deal. That is the cause of your spiritual death. And I'm not speaking to somebody here who's better than you. I, too, have made mistakes, plenty of them. Just ask my wife and my daughter in the front row. I mean, I've done so many mistakes. I'm a guilty sinner just like everybody else. The only difference is my story doesn't end in verse 1, 2, or 3. But I still deal with some of this stuff, and we deal with it In our world today, every time you get cut off in traffic, every time somebody cusses at you, every time somebody gets angry at you, every time you fail to do what you're supposed to do, you are living proof that chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 1, is still true to this day. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. That's our culture around us. And our culture around us does not want us to live in God's way. It's a different way altogether. Also, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. This is what we call Satan or the devil. He's at work now. He says the spirit who is at now at work in those who are disobedient. And Satan would love for us to do things. And that's why the world is corrupted. Why our relationships are corrupted. Verse 3, and all of us, you and me, all of us together, lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, doing what we wanted to, whether it was right or not, and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Wrath is a punishment that is deserved for something that was done wrong. Somebody comes and takes something, your your precious, whatever it was, something that belongs to you, and you catch them doing it, and it's expensive, and they damaged it. They should pay for it, right? I mean, it's their fault. It got broken. They should pay for it, right? Well, God's wrath is against us for the wrong that we have done, and the problem is that price is more than any of us can pay. We cannot get right on our own. We can never do it right on our own. And so we bring this junk, this sin, and this this transgression into our relationships. And because we're messed up people, we mess up one another. And even though we crave one another, and like the Harvard studies show, we know we need good relationships. We know healthy relationships are going to make us happy and fulfilled. But we keep messing it up because as long as I got a relationship, I'm in it and I ain't perfect. 
I'm going to mess it up. And so we find ourselves at the end of verse 3 in this horrible situation, hopeless situation. But then verse 4 comes along. But, sometimes but's a great word. (laughs) But, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, he loves you, and he's willing to not punish you for what you deserve, made us alive together with Christ. In other words, he has risen us from the dead just as he's raised Jesus from the dead. And we are alive just as Jesus is alive. Even when we were dead in those transgressions, spiritually dead, It is by grace you have been saved. It's the gift of God that we've been brought into this restoration when we believe in him. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What he's saying is is that we've been raised up. We get to spend eternity with God forever and ever. We are with him. This is what he enables. Even though we're messed up people, even though we are hopeless on our own because Jesus is risen from the dead, God makes a way for us. But what does it take to get this gift? We see this in the next verse. For it is by grace. Grace is a word for a gift. It's not something you earn or deserve. It is by grace you are saved through faith. That's believing. That's your part in this. That is receiving the gift that is offered to you. That is opening up your arms and saying, yes, Lord, I will receive it. I believe. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. In other words, it's not a matter of working really hard, and maybe if I'm really, really, really good, and I do everything right and perfect, maybe God will welcome me back. No, can't do it. Maybe if I pray really hard, and I pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then then I'll be spiritual enough for God to, to, to take me in. Nope, never happened. Maybe if I give away enough money, I'll be good enough to do it. Nope, doesn't work. Maybe if I help enough old ladies to go across the street, I'll be able to do it. Nope. Maybe if I'll help enough kids at the family Easter fest. Nope, none of it. It doesn't matter. There's no way we can do it on our own, but what we could never do, God did for us. And that is the message of grace. Down in verse 13, he writes, Now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's what he shed on the cross. That's why the cross is the central pivot point of Christianity. And so the hopeless situation we had is now filled with hope because of what Jesus has done for us. And when we come to him, when we receive that gift of grace, it opens up the door for us to have healthy human relationships. Look at the next verse, verse 14. For he himself, that is Jesus, is our peace, our shalom once again, who has made the two groups one, that is Jews and Gentiles. Those are not Jews. They've been divided because of the law, because of the old system. The Jews had a relationship and access to God that those who were not Jews didn't. But now under Jesus, all of us can come together. It doesn't matter where you're born, what your ethnicity is, what your history is. We can all come together and be together. And, and that's why our, our statement here is, is, is we are connecting people to God and one another here at Bellevue Neighborhood Church because there is a relational connection. And I love that our church represents the world and we can be restored because Jesus rose again from the dead and I believe that's why he used that greeting peace be with you because now the resurrection enables that restoration and reconciliation to happen we can be brought together again For he himself, Jesus is our peace, who has made the two groups into one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. One new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. Shalom. Jesus describes that Restored relationship in the verse we looked at earlier. Remember what he's told Mary Magdalene to go and tell the disciples? He said, go instead to my brothers and tell them. 
I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. These are the same disciples who all abandoned Jesus, turned, ran away from him when the soldiers came to arrest them. He's saying, my relationship with you is restored. Your relationship with one another is restored. Now, of course, the restoration of relationship is only the beginning. It's not just the shaking hands and making up. We need to live it out. And anything we do with Jesus involves living out the principles that we have. That's why we're going to spend five more weeks looking at the Bible's principles for healthy relationships. You know, relationships are tough, as we said. And you know, the Bible has a lot to say about that. I've been doing a lot of study, course in Scripture, but I'm also consulting all the secular experts, the the non-Christian sources, a lot of books written, studies that shown what makes for good, healthy relationships. And you know what's kind of funny? Is the vast majority of them agree with the Bible, even though the Bible was written 2,000 years ago. They're, They're kind of discovering that God had already revealed all these principles for healthy relationships. So whether or not neighborhood is your church, I want to encourage you to just plan. Can you make a commitment to be with us for the next five weeks? We're going to talk about things like defining the relationship. Okay, what does that mean? How do you start a relationship? How do you overcome conflict when you have a disagreement one person to another? How do you recover from a broken and wounded relationship? You know, the source of so much relationship problems is communication. We're going to talk about how do you communicate effectively. It's going to be well with your time. So I encourage you, make that promise to be back here the next five weeks. But however important and great and wonderful our human relationships with are, they only come to their best when we start with a foundational relationship that was truly born on Easter. And that is peace with God. Back in Ephesians 2, the next verse, 2.16 says, In one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. In other words, he is reconciled. A big word that means the relationship is restored. The cross, the offering on that half, it made it so that we can have our relationship with God restored. We can be in God's family. We can have God as our father. And that is the relationship that is the most important foundation for everything else. It is the source of eternal life, of living forever with God. It's also the source of eternal joy that we also get to experience in this life and I want to be clear joy doesn't mean you never have trouble there are challenges and and Jesus even said he told the disciples in John 16 in this world you will have trouble but fear not for I have overcome the world and why is he saying he said I said this so that in you may have peace in me and it is in Jesus that we have the peace the shalom to get us through the storm so even though the world is raging outside even though the world around you may not do everything you want it to you have that overwhelming foundation of God's shalom that flows and gives you the overall state of well-being body mind heart soul spirit and flowing into your other relationships as well there is nothing like it And I said, we talked about Easter on Christmas. Let's talk about Christmas on Easter. Remember what the angel said to the shepherds? Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace. This is shalom. This is it. You know, yesterday we had our family Easter fest and we saw that the pictures there. And the goal of that event is to let other people know about this message of peace with God that we all can have, that Jesus Christ has made available. That's why everybody who came, we encouraged them all, and most went through and sat in the fireside room and watched a video presentation of the good news of Jesus Christ, of his resurrection, what it means for us. And our Northwest University interns gave them the invitation to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Invited them to come back. Some of you may be here today, and I want you to say, I want to say thank you for coming and being with us today. And it was a great event. I could, you heard we had over 650 people here. I mean, it was, it was exciting. And, and we had a lot of volunteers, and it couldn't have happened without all of your efforts. And I just want to point out one particular volunteer who had a very significant day. And in fact, today is Ryan McKenzie's 50th birthday. 
We say happy birthday to Ryan. And what's significant for Ryan, so many things, is a year ago on Easter Sunday, he was baptized right there in that water baptism tank. He had committed his life to Jesus uh, several months before that. And I asked him yesterday about his spiritual journey, and he said he kind of traces it back about 10 years ago. He was driving in the car with his then wife, and they were having some sort of a spiritual conversation, and he was talking about his doubts of God's existence. He said, well, if God exists, he could like reveal himself right on the other side of that hill. They drove over a hill, and there was a barn with a scripture verse painted on it. Okay, like, okay, that's going to be something there. And then Ryan started uh, attending church several years later, and was going there, and there was one particular song, Reckless Love, that just kind of resonated with him. And one time about a year and a half ago, while hearing that song, it just hit him, and the power of the Holy Spirit just hit him and brought him to a place where he said, I surrender to Jesus. It's what the Bible calls repentance, but he surrendered, and he gave up junk in his life, like you know, smoking weed and drinking and other things like that, that's no longer going to be a part of his life. Started following Jesus, started coming to church every week, started growing, connecting, made that commitment to receive Jesus. Started to experience the power of God in his life. So yesterday, Ryan was out there along with Joe Luxem and Tim Condout making burgers, hundreds and hundreds of burgers, flip, 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 flipping burgers for four and a half hours, feeding all the people who came through. And then it was all done, we were all getting all cleaned up, and if you were here, you know that in this room we had a giant inflatable slide, huge slide. In fact, most of the kids I talked to, I'd always ask them, okay, what was your favorite thing? Oh, the slide, the slide. And we rented that, um, and uh, the, the family that owns the company that we rented it from, one of the sons, Eduardo, and his girlfriend, Diana, he, you know, Eduardo's 23, and they came in and they set it all up, and so we're all done at one o'clock, tearing things down, and they deflate it, get it all rode up, and like any young man, Eduardo's got to show the world how strong he is, so he got it loaded up and was in the process of loading it in the back of his van and had a heart attack and passed out completely, stopped breathing, heart stopped pumping. His girlfriend was screaming. Ryan heard it and ran over. Now, Ryan has been trained. He is a plumber. He's been trained in CPR, been through the class three times, never administered CPR, but in that moment knew he needed to take action. He immediately started CPR. Jessica Zonneveld called the 911. They were out here within a few minutes. Jessica took over to relieve Ryan. Joe Luxem came in other there as well, and they came and they got him, and they took Eduardo to Overlake Hospital, um, admitted him to the critical care unit. Yesterday afternoon, about five o'clock, Kira had gotten Diana's number and texted, and we called, and they said, you know, we're all here, and the whole extended family was there. We got to go and pray, pray with Eduardo. He had come to, he was alert, he was smiling. The family was grateful in tears. The doctors had said that CPR in all likelihood saved his life. Jesus can change lives. The family asked for Ryan's number and they've been in communication. Eduardo's coming home from the hospital this afternoon. (laughs) Surrender. Ryan made the choice to surrender to Jesus. We know that in 1945, Japan surrendered in August the United States of America to bring the official end of World War II. But but 29 years later, 1974, on the Philippine island of Lubang, Hiru Onoda was discovered still fighting, still hiding. 29 years later, he was discovered and a colleague of his, a former, one of his former a cohort came forward and asked him and was able to persuade him to come out, lay down his arms, and surrender. The war had been over for 29 years, but Hero was still fighting it. Then 31 years later, on May 26, 2005, almost 60 years after the war was over, 
Yoshio Yamakawa, at that time 87 years old, and Suzuki Nakauchi, 85, supposedly emerged from the jungle of Mindanao Island on the Philippines and said they were former members of a division whose ranks were devastated in fierce battle with U.S. forces towards the end of the war. Think about it. Those individuals still fighting, still hiding. What suffering did they endure? What kind of garbage did they have to go to? And if they would have just come out, the war was over. Japan was at peace. Life could have been good for them. Instead, they were hiding in fear. The two in Mindanao were supposedly hiding because they were afraid they would be court-martialed for desertion if they ever showed their faces again. You know, that's so much the case for so many people today. We keep looking everywhere else but except turning to Jesus. Keep hoping one more promotion, a bigger paycheck, a fancier car, a nicer vacation, maybe a better looking girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever the case is, maybe, maybe something more is going to fill this deep hunger in my heart. And we're so unwilling to surrender to say, Jesus, maybe you're the answer. Maybe you are indeed the hope of the world. Can I just tell you, after walking with Jesus since I was 18 and making my own decision to surrender, he has never failed me. And everything that I have, I owe to him. And there is no difference. I don't have to be here. I don't have to be your pastor. I was a civil engineer in the Air Force before I got here. I could have made a whole lot more money doing other things. But can I tell you, my life isn't about money. It's about Jesus. And as incredible as my relationship with Kira is, as priceless as that relationship is, you know what makes it the best? Is that we are neither's number one. By going to Jesus first, there is the overflow. Because I know I could never meet Kira's needs fully. But by going to Jesus and having him be the source of my shalom, I now have all the peace and all the joy that can overflow and bring blessing in other areas. So I don't know what you've been doing in your own journey, in your own situation and as the worship team comes back to the platform i want to invite you to just consider what would it take for you to surrender where have you been looking you know tomorrow is april 1st not only does that mean it's april fool's day it means that two weeks later is april 15th anybody done yet no, no, not done yet? Okay, all right. You know, what's interesting, I went on the IRS website this week, and I found there are almost $1 billion of refunds yet to be claimed for 2020 taxes. $1 billion that are people's money that they're not going to get if they don't fill out the right form by May 17th. It's gone. It goes back in the U.S. Treasury. It's there. Average person that gets about $957 just because they never took the time to fill out the form and make the claim for what's theirs. You know, the same thing's true of this message, this good news of Jesus, the peace of God. We've been talking about the shalom, the ultimate source of joy in this life and eternity with God forever. You've got to choose to claim it. It's yours. But you have to choose to receive it. Remember what we saw, Ephesians 2, verse 8. For it is by grace, that's God's gift, you don't earn it. You have been saved through faith. That's your part. It's just believing, receiving, just saying, yes, Lord, I accept it. I accept it from you today. I'm tired of trying to figure this thing out on my own. I'm not doing well at it. My relationships are a mess. My life are a mess. Or maybe they aren't. Maybe your relationship with life is great. But you still know there is something more. Your eternity is not yet secure. I want to invite you to just close your eyes and bow your head while you're seated where you are. By grace, you can be saved through faith. This is not from you. It is a gift of God. Not by your own works that no one can boast. And though you were dead, you can be raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You can come to have that peace with God and the eternal source of joy that it is. And if you're ready to do that by faith, I'd love to pray with you. 
I'm going to invite you, if you're here today, and you'd say, whether maybe it's the first time, or maybe you've been away from God, maybe you've allowed other things to capture your mind and your heart, and it's time to surrender. Instead of just even a little bit of Jesus, just enough, you know, that doesn't work. He's got to be Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. If you're ready to surrender, ready to say, yes, Lord, I receive your gift today. I'm going to claim what's mine, that salvation that you rose from the dead to give me, that peace I want with me. Would you raise your hand so I can pray with you? Several hands going up. Anyone else here today? Don't want to give you any more opportunity. Anyone else here today? I'm going to ask us all to just repeat after me together. So those who are saying this for the first time can have others saying it with them because we all need this. It's great for all of us to just remember this. Say, dear God. Once again, dear God. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that in Jesus I can have eternal life. I receive him as my Savior today. I believe in him. Help me to live for you. And give me your peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.